This is also, as Vanessa men <clears throat> mentioned, part of the launch of Cities for People, which you'll be hearing more about soon. One of our goals is to figure out how we can help Canadian cities become more shareable cities and what it would mean for Canada to become a global leader in this space. What we're going to do tonight is I am going to show you how the collaborative economy or the sharing economy, and we'll talk about both, has the power to transform communities, build a more sustainable future. Yes, oh, that sounds much better. Okay, and I'm not shouting as well. Um, and improve social outcomes. We're going to do this by looking at how some of these new collaborative business models and platforms are reimagining marketplaces, lifestyles, and cities. I'm going to share with you examples and stories from around the world of how this is happening and how Canada fits in. On the market end of things, we're going to look at how this is disrupting a lot of marketplaces, but also the new business opportunities this opens up. On the city side, we're going to look at the key role that the collaborative economy plays to boost resilience and the roles, the absolutely essential roles for local government. Now, I've only been able to pick a few examples out of literally thousands that I could have tonight. Some of them will be likely familiar to many of you in this room. That is intentional because one of the things I want to do is show you how what used to be niche behavior has now gone mainstream. Of course, I do hope that I share a lot with you tonight that you've never heard of before. In addition, we want to look at, speaking of social innovation generation, looking at how the collaborative economy is a form of social innovation with social means and social ends that has the power to think to rethink how we look at all resources which go into a system and in a way at the end of the day transform society my hope is that at the end of tonight you'll see how broad and diverse the collaborative economy is how easy it is to get involved and benefit from it and that what's happening here in Vancouver and across Canada is part of a much larger global phenomenon. Now, before we dive into what the collaborative economy looks like today, let's do a little bit of history to figure out how we ended up here. As we all know, there's nothing new about sharing. It's the oldest behavior known to mankind. But for contemporary purposes, what is new is the advent of technologies that enable us to connect with, to find one another, to connect with one another, and to share more things in more ways. And for practical purposes, we can trace a lot of this back to the establishment of the internet, which for the first time enabled us to connect in ways that were literally impossible before. So for, for tonight's purposes, let's start about 19 years ago. Let's go back to 1995, when an entrepreneur named Piero Midiar conducted a little social experiment in his quest to form the perfect marketplace. Over the course of a weekend, Pierre built a very simple website on which you could buy and sell things. The first thing he put on this website is this broken laser pointer for $14.83. You can imagine how surprised he was when shortly thereafter he received a bid for $14.83. And he emailed the potential purchaser and said, oh, you realize this is broken. <clears throat> and the, the purchaser emailed back and said, yes, you realize I am a collector of broken laser pointers. <laughs> <coughs> now, those of you who have heard the name Piero Midiar may know this company is eBay. 130 million people around the world bought and sold goods on eBay last year. At any given point in time, half a billion items are for sale, many of which are secondary goods, and that's important because it relates to sustainability. But think about how this created a market that did not exist before. Now what Pierre really tapped into is the ability for these new technologies to match needs and haves in new ways and to create marketplaces with inventory that could scale. In addition, we're looking at how technologies can help begin to form trust between not only neighbors, but strangers. This is a real key core driver before, be, behind the collaborative economy. I think of this as version 1.0. Also around the very same time, entrepreneurs here in Canada, in Montreal, were building this on this idea of matching needs and haves, and in this case thought, why is it what would happen if instead of owning vehicles, we could tap into a shared fleet? They went on to found 
Comunauto, which is the first large-scale car sharing platform in all of North America. What I want to point out here is how incredibly early this was. E extremely early and extremely progressive, so to speak. Now, this shows you how Canada was, again, already ahead of the curve. Fast forward five years and a woman named Robin Chase follows in Comunauto's path. She starts wondering what would happen if we could tap into a fleet of shared vehicles rather than having the burdens of outright ownership. Robin had looked into what we call the cost usage equation of cars, and as many of you probably know, it's pretty bad. On average, a car sits idle 23 hours a day, that's 95% of the time, and costs more than $700 a month to maintain. Pause and think about this. This is a behavior that most people have come to believe is it's normal, that we just accept that that's kind of what we do with cars. It's incredibly wasteful. It's a huge waste of money, and it's also obviously a waste of natural resources. So Robin went on to found the company, which many of us probably know is Zipcar. Zipcar today is the world's largest car sharing platform. They have, they're across North America as well as in Europe. They have about one million members, but it's estimated that by 2020, more than 30 million people will be members of car sharing networks like it. So what Robin was really looking at is not just how do we match needs and haves, but a broader trend towards being able to access goods and services rather than paying outright to own everything, what we could term very heavy overhead. This too is a second core key seed behind the collaborative economy. Now fast forward a few more years, 2008, 2009, what happens? Yes, we see an explosion, continued growth in the internet, and growth in a lot of other kinds of social media that allow us to connect things. In addition, as we all know, in 2008, we saw a global economic crisis. But what I want to underscore tonight is that the global economic crisis did not cause the collaborative economy to grow. These are separate. The drivers behind the collaborative economy were in place well before. Although we could say that the crisis catalyzed further growth in this space. What else happened during this time? There was also the emergence of a new kind of company. It was so small then you probably didn't even notice it. What began as two roommates named Brian and Joe, who could not afford rent in San Francisco. At the time there was a big convention in town and not enough hotel rooms. So Brian and Joe had this idea, what would happen if we took an air bed and put it in our living room, invited people to stay with us, and they paid, paid us for that time. Like Pierre, they were quite surprised when they had dozens of people contact them and say they were interested, and ultimately three people stayed with them, and they had a great time. Not only were they able to cover rent, but they also met really interesting people and enjoyed building new friendships, new relationships. Now this company has gone on to become Airbnb, which I assume many of you know of. It is now a global online peer-to-peer -peer accommodation marketplace. On Airbnb, you can find all kinds of properties to rent. Spare rooms in your house, your holiday home. Here in Vancouver, there are about 700 properties on Airbnb. Calgary has about 150. Toronto, about 900. And Montreal has more than 1,000 properties. So, you know, it's taking root across Canada as well, as I'm sure a lot of you know. In addition, though, where it gets really interesting is this is not just about an extra room in your hall, home. You can find all kinds of properties on Airbnb. Igloos, converted airplanes, tree houses, even the entire principality of Liechtenstein available for rent. I'm not joking. If you want to throw a really awesome party, Liechtenstein will give you special street signs and special currency. <laughs> I'm not joking. This has two main effects. First, all of a sudden we're creating markets for things that didn't have markets before. Again, we're giving these properties global reach, global, a global audience. Before, you could put a sign in front of your igloo and say, you know, igloo for rent, but someone halfway around the world certainly couldn't find it and come stay with you easily. Now they can. Secondly, the people that have these assets can generate income from them. So, for example, this treehouse, which is usually booked up more than six months in advance, the income generated from the treehouse is often sufficient to pay the mortgage for the main house out front. Because this is in somebody's backyard. Think about the power of this to transform marketplaces, 
but also lifestyles and also what this means for cities. So where does this bring us today, 2014? And what does this mean for the future? Again, a few observations. First, as I mentioned, we are seeing an absolute explosion of technologies that continue to enable us to connect more people and more things in more ways. More assets. But assets aren't just your car and your house. We can look at all kinds of space, all kinds of stuff, which could include both cars and bikes, but also lawnmowers and tools. And we'll talk again more about all various kinds of stuff in a moment. And also sharing of skills, sharing of human talent. In particular, though, we're interested in those technologies which enable people to connect and have assets to share that have what we call idling capacity. This is the untapped value. This is the 23 hours a day in the car. When we think about putting an asset with idling capacity into shared use, in effect, what we're doing is unlocking the wealth, tapping into value that's been in that asset all along, but it was invisible to us before. And what's beautiful, it's not asking us to buy anything else, not asking us to do anything else. We're using these resources more efficiently and we're connecting with others. Idling capacity is a really powerful concept to get your head around. What I love too is that it exists everywhere. This is in your house. You can think about your car or your second car, or your lawnmower, or snowblower, or your clothing or your kids' clothes, or the list goes on. It's estimated that the average Canadian family has $4,000 of stuff that is at all times just sitting idle. That may or may not be a lot of money to you, but think about how that plays out at the, the national population level. It's huge. It also exists in businesses' supply chains, and it also exists through in all of the assets owned by a city. So spaces, buildings, fleets of cars that, car that, that a city owns. Think about it this way, and this starts to get really, really interesting. And again, key connections to sustainability, and communi community connectedness. It's not just about technology innovation, though. That is only one of a much broader set of drivers that are transforming and propelling the collaborative economy forward. In addition to technology innovation, we're looking at a broader values shift towards systems, relationships, even business models that are more open, more human, and more connected. A lot of this is stemming from the disconnection and isolation that's crept into society in recent decades. In addition, as I mentioned, economic realities, which the 2008, sorry, I've been talking a lot this week. Economic realities, which the 2008 global crisis brought home, but again, it, not just that. We've also been looking at a series of environmental pressures, population growth, limited natural resources, and the effects of climate change being increasingly understood. These four drivers together have had a massive effect on every, <coughs> sorry, every aspect of our life. Oh my goodness. How we work, how we live, how we dream, and how we think about the future. Third, sorry, that's a little, a little dark, that says the great power shift. But what I want to talk about is the great power and trust shift. We are seeing a shift of trust and power away from centralized institutions towards decentralized networks of individuals. Big companies and big governments are amongst the least trusted institutions in the world today. Meanwhile, things that it used to be only a big company could do to produce, for example, you and I, with some technology, can now do a lot of this ourselves. Extremely exciting. And think about the sectors that we've already seen disrupted in this way. Publishing, banking, manufacturing. But where it gets really interesting for me is we are still very early on in this process. And you can see the sectors that are, in a way, lining up to be disrupted next. And the saying goes, either disrupt or be disrupted. Now, if we combine the technology innovation, the different drivers and values I mentioned, and the great power and trust shift, we begin to recognize that we may be in the early stages of what we can th think of as a peer revolution, of which right now we can only see the tip of the iceberg. Now, some people might be going, oh my god, this is, this is a lot of change, this is a lot of unknown, upheaval. I look at this and I get so excited because I just see a world of opportunity and ways that individuals can do things that before access was much more restricted. If we take a snapshot, and I apologize that the tech 
text is kind of small. Um, in terms of where the collaborative economy is today, a couple of other observations. First, this is pervasive. The collaborative economy now takes place in every sector you can imagine. Um, I've begun to challenge my friends, either you know, give me a sector, any sector. I will either tell you what's happening in it, or if we were to spend five minutes together, we could come up with a business model, and we'll talk about the role of money, with or without money, we could come up with a business model that's not pie in the sky. The question is no longer what can you share, but rather what can't you share. And the best examples I've come up of that are toothbrushes and wedding rings. I used to say you can't share kids until so many parents were like, you can totally share my kids. <laughs> so in any case, this is happening just across the board. Secondly, this is global. This is taking place in cities of all sizes around the world. And that's one of the things I enjoy most about what I do. We've worked on every continent except for Antarctica. And this is taking place in the most unexpected places as well as more and more in cities and major markets. It's attracting the attention of media. These are magazine covers from the last year. And uh, the guy on the left is Brian from Airbnb. It's also attracting the attention of investors. It's estimated that at the end of 2013, more than $2 billion have, have been invested in collaborative, com collaborative economy companies. Um, and it's also reaching places like Davos the World Economic Forum, which you may like or may not like, but it's reaching that level. This is extremely exciting. I will say the World Economic Forum doesn't quite know what to do with this because it challenges so many traditional models, which is another thing that I just love. <laughs> the, this is what's happening here in Canada. So this is just a sampling of publications and things happening in the last few months here. Nora Young hosted a CBC Spark program. There is the excellent sharing project here in Vancouver, which we're going to talk more about later. Big hats off there. A writer in Toronto, collaborative economy will tower above all trends. And, and Toronto and other cities as well. But Toronto in particular has a thriving swap and barter community. Again, I could have picked lots of other examples. This is just the sampling of what's happening here in Canada. And what does this mean, though, for the companies themselves? So this is a map of Airbnb. This is Metropolitan Paris in 2008, shortly after it launched. The pink dots, if you can see, I apologize that the slides are a bit dark. The pink dots are where there are Airbnb properties. Now fast forward, not even five years, and what do you get? There is literally at least one Airbnb property on every block in the entire metropolitan area. Airbnb globally, has more than 500,000 properties in more than 34,000 cities in 192 countries around the world. Keep in mind, Airbnb doesn't own a single bit of this inventory. This is all about individuals like you and me being able to do more things in more ways. Not surprisingly, I am a traveler, avid traveler on Airbnb, and also a host. I've used Airbnb from San Francisco, California, to London, to Italy, to Rwanda. So I went to Rwanda last year, stayed on Airbnb. What I love, the Airbnb team did not know they had places in Rwanda until I told them. But think about that. And I was able to help the local Rwandan entrepreneurs generate income while I was there. Meanwhile, while I'm in Rwanda, I can post my house in San Francisco on Airbnb and enable someone else to enjoy their holiday and, and earn some income as well. Think about this in the context, again, of marketplaces, lifestyles, and cities, and how powerfully transformative it is. Now, we're going to dive back into a bunch more examples in just a moment, but I want to take one minute to do a little bit of vocab, simply because one of the goals this week is to spark a broader conversation about the collaborative economy and the sharing economy, and give Cities for People, in particular, a vehicle to carry this forward. And one of the things that we find again and again is that a lot of people say, oh, I'm involved in this space, but I, I'm not necessarily using common terms to talk to other people about that. And if we want to build something bigger, we need to at least be trying to use some of the same words. It helps a lot to be talking about apples and apples. So real quick, just a couple of slides. First, the sharing economy. When we talk about the sharing economy, and again, these are open for debate. I'm simply trying to give a little bit of a framework here. When we think about the sharing economy, we're really focused on those platforms and models 
that enable us to share assets with idling capacity. And that idling capacity is key because that's what makes it really shareable. That's what gives the sharing, again, economic efficiency, but also environmental sustainability and community connectedness. Now, the sharing economy can take place with or without money and with or without technology. You can imagine sharing something, an asset that you have because you want to make money or save money or both. You can also imagine sharing it simply because it's a good thing to do. You can imagine sharing without a fancy website or app. Although I will say we've seen that technology simply enhances significantly the things you can find and the people you can find to share with. But it's not required. And this is where it goes back to the traditional notions of neighborhood sharing and things you want to do in the community that, again, does, don't require anything too fancy. The sharing economy is often also referred to as collaborative consumption. And there's a lot of overlap. Um, we see them a little bit differently, and collaborative consumption in particular we look at as the reinvention of traditional marketplace behaviors, transactions, so things like renting and borrowing and swapping and gifting and lending, through technology in ways and on a scale never before possible. In the process, we are redefining not just what we consume, but how we consume. And in the process, <clears throat> We're also doing things like creating more collaborative lifestyles. So when you travel with Airbnb rather than stay in a hotel, it's collaborative consumption, but you're living a different kind of lifestyle that's more, again, collaborative and connected. We're also looking at the ability for collaborative consumption to create markets for things that didn't have markets before and looking at that in the, in the, effect, in the <clears throat> context of redistribution. But where it gets really interesting is when we look at collaborative consumption, apologies, <coughs> Perfect. When we look at collaborative consumption as part of a much larger pie called the collaborative economy. So the collaborative consumption is just one piece. Zoom out and look at the collaborative economy as encompassing not just collaborative forms of consumption, but also collaborative production, so things like the maker movement, collaborative finance, things like crowdfunding, and collaborative learning and education, so things like online skill sharing platforms. All of these things together are affecting literally every part of our economy today and really have a lovely connection back to the new economy, so to speak. And I like to say that I'm pretty sure everyone here tonight has been affected by the collaborative economy already in some way, even though you might not have been calling it that. Hopefully, moving forward, we can start, again, using some of this shared vocabulary so that we can spark a much bigger, deeper, more robust conversation. <laughs> now, with that vocab lesson over, let's dive back in to some examples. So another great example of idling capacity is the fact that 80% of all rides taken are solo rides. That's crazy. That's just like, wow. We've come to believe that that behavior is, is normal. Enter Lyft. Lyft is a real-time ride-sharing community. Lyft enables, in effect, each one of us to be kind of like a taxi driver. If we have our own car, and we'd like to set our own hours, and we'd like to transit our friends and other people in the community around, that's kind of what Lyft provides. Lyft is a platform. It is an app. So when I need to go somewhere, I log on to the Lyft app. I say, pick me up. Uh, the Lyft driver sees me agrees to come pick me up, and I can see where he is and when he's going to arrive, and that makes me really happy. Then he picks me up, drops me off, I pay him or her through the app. We peer review each other about the experience, and we're done. Simple as that. In the process, Lyft reduces the cost of transportation, reduces CO2 emissions, and reduces congestion in cities. This transforms the marketplace. It has never been easier to get from point A to point B. It's probably worth noting for those entrepreneurs in the, in the audience as well, Lyft is one of the fastest growing companies in this space today. They currently exist in 19 cities across the US, but as I joke, they're launching in so many cities each week that it may well be up to 20 or 21 by now. And I wouldn't be surprised to see something like it arrive here. And I would say there's, there is Pogo Ride, so that's, it's, it's a variation on this model. If you want to learn more about what's happening locally, talk to Ryder afterwards. But Lyft isn't just about economics and the environment. It's also about fun and a sense of community. For fun, we need look no further, and the colors are, it's not my deck, the colors up here are a little bit muted. It's a neon pink 
mustache on, the to on, the, on that car. It's called a car stash. This shows you, identifies that you are in a lift vehicle. So for those people who are thinking, are you kidding me? Are you going to get in a car with a stranger through an app? You're nuts. You know exactly what you're doing. And you know everyone in town knows when you're in a lift vehicle. And if you're also concerned about safety, on all counts, what, it, what is required to become a Lyft driver, that bar is higher on every metric than for taxi drivers. In addition, when you greet your Lyft driver, the typical way you do so is with a fist bump. So if you can see down there, this guy is fist bumping his driver. Fun, simply fun, that's it. In addition though, we're looking at building community. And this isn't something that Lyft is itself doing. This is something that the community, the people using Lyft are doing. So on one hand, we have a community of passengers who now can travel more affordably and, and have more fun while doing so. But in particular, what's interesting is the community of drivers that's evolving. So on one hand, many Lyft drivers have other passions, other careers they're pursuing, maybe music or acting or becoming a chef. Because they set their own hours, they can use Lyft income to help pursue these other passions and also have a flexible work schedule. But what we see are also Lyft drivers collaborating with one another outside of the Lyft platform. So starting bands together, companies, whatnot. This is really special. And this particular example is a bit different than that, but it's a form of community. I apologize, the text is a little bit, um, little bit small. But in effect, a lot of drivers enjoy kind of duding up their cars and making the experience, again, fun for passengers. So this guy on the left, he bakes cookies, different kind of cookie each day of the week for his passengers. Another one has karaoke in their car. And another one on the bottom right has a library. So when you're taking a trip together, you're writing short stories and haikus and poetry. And then when you're done, you leave it in our little car library. That's just fun. And that's but really building a sense of solidarity, a sense of community, and so forth. And this is where I like to pull out that sense of social innovation. Think about how we're really rethinking every means, every input that's going into transportation. It, it truly has the power to transform the entire system and the entire way we think about getting around in cities. Now, despite all of the benefits and the exciting, fun stuff around Lyft, it has faced more than its fair share of challenges, in particular, regulatory challenges. So last year, it seemed like every other week, Lyft was being dealt a fine or a ban or a cease and desist letter. Even in those cities where it had been invited to operate, it was then getting slapped with some kind of, you know, no, we don't really like this, we don't know what to do. Not only from the incumbent taxi lobby, which needless to say is not too pleased, but as I like to say, if you show me a city where taxis work and I'll move there, but if there's any industry that's ripe for some kind of disruption, taxis are one of them. The reason why is largely because Lyft operates in many cities in what you can think of as a regulatory gray area. It's not a taxi, so taxi regulations don't apply. But there isn't any other regulation that really fits. And I think we would all acknowledge that this isn't the kind of activity that you just leave unregulated. There are issues of public safety and security and so forth. However, not to be too you know, depressed about this, after all of this back and forth and challenges, last September, the California Public Utilities Commission, which is the main transportation regulator for the state of California, which I get it's California, but a lot of these companies do get started there, so the CPUC is actually a really important body to watch. After serving, again, bans and whatnot, the same organization unanimously voted to establish a brand new kind of company called a Transportation Network Corporation, a TNC, which gives Lyft and other ride-sharing platforms like it express authority to operate. They are regulated, but they are regulated for what they are, not trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. So when I look at this, this is the kind of thing that a lot of other cities are now looking at, which will enable Lyft to go mainstream. And I wouldn't be surprised, again, to see it arrive here somewhere in Canada, something like it, or more Pogo Ride expansion, very, very soon. Now, let's look at another example from here, and I know lots of people. Who's involved with the Vancouver Tool Library here tonight? The founder, right here. Anyone else? Members? Just curious. Awesome. Okay. I couldn't help, of course, but in a, uh, 
a slide about tool libraries. And there are tool libraries around the world. The Vancouver Tool Library is one of my favorite examples. It's local here, but it has global relevance. So another great example of idling capacity. Power drills, several of you have probably heard. On average, a power drill costs $100, and it is used 14 minutes in its entire life. <laughs> now, what's more is you don't actually need the drill. You need the hole, right? So it's an expensive hole, and it's a really wasteful hole. <laughs> the tool library takes care of this and a whole lot more. And the Vancouver Tool Library, there are different models behind this, but here it's a cooperative. So you pay a one-time fee to become a member of the cooperative, and then you pay an annual membership fee that allows you to access tools, all kinds of tools, not just power drills, things for gardening, for home repair, bicycle maintenance, you name it. So pause for just a minute and think about this. Like, why wouldn't you do this? For less than the cost of a power drill, you can access the power drill and a whole lot more. This is also something that's really easy for a city to support and sponsor. This is also something that's really easy to do without a lot of money and without a lot of technology. So you can imagine this where you are paying a membership fee and you've got access to hundreds and hundreds of tools. You could also imagine doing this in your neighborhood where everyone's just pooling together their tools and no one's paying anything. Um, but it's, it's simple and you're, you're also getting to know your neighbors. Technology, again, what we find is in the neighborhood setting and in the setting like the tool library, yes, you have a website, but you don't need a fancy app for something like this. And we're seeing neighborhood-led sharing initiatives just explode in growth. Some of my favorite other platforms around the world include Street Bank in the UK, a company called Peerby in the Netherlands, and Yertle in the US, which is, all of these are different models, but, but same principle. Now where it gets really interesting also is if we take the tool library concept and zoom out to a different level and we end up at Tech Shop. Tech Shop is part studio, part hacker space, and part learning center. They call themselves a playground for creativity. Similar to the tool library concept, you pay an an a monthly or annual membership and you get unlimited access to Tech Shop, both the space and the tools in it. But when I'm talking about tools, I'm not talking about power drills. I'm talking about things like 3D printers and laser cutters and quilting machines and really sophisticated technology that previously we could not easily afford or access, even in someone's garage. It's not that people have laser cutters just lying around in a neighborhood. The technology at Tech Shop is so, much of it is so sophisticated that it's also enabling entrepreneurs to prototype products. So, you know the Square payment mechanism, I assume, if you've seen Square. Square was prototyped at Tech Shop. It's now a company with a multi-billion dollar valuation, started in a hacker space. Think about how this too is transforming not just the marketplace, but lifestyles and cities. And in particular, the cities piece, because what we're doing is not just enabling people to prototype stuff. Tech Shop itself is creating an environment and an ecosystem that encourages not only innovation, but collaborative production. So go back to the collaborative economy piece. We're looking at creating a community of citizens that are creative and engaged and collaborating, and it's just layer upon layer of benefit. And this, I find a really good example of social innovation also, where we're redefining access to what kinds of goods that is playing out, again, at the societal level. Now let's take another example, continuing our tour. Let's go over to the UK and look at how the collaborative economy is affecting health and well-being. This is one of my favorite examples. It's called Good Gym. Good Gym is about getting fit by doing good. It was founded by a group of runners who were really frustrated by, on one hand, how much waste, wasted energy and wasted human potential they saw in gyms. And at the same time, how disconnected they felt from other members in their community. So they established this website platform called Good Gym, and they do a few different things. I'll just share a couple examples. One, Good Gym, run, Good Gym runners go on what they call missions. So in particular, they're trying to partner with people who are homebound, isolated, disconnected, somehow unable to connect with community. So uh, one of those people will put in a mission. For example, I need a light bulb replaced, or I need somebody to deliver my prescription. They do not have the ability to go and do that. 
So a good gym runner says, I'll take up that mission. They run to their house, they replace the light bulb, and they run home. <laughs> That's all it is. That costs nothing, but think about what we just did. We matched a need and a have, we met a fellow member of our community, and we stayed fit. In addition, they go on things called coaching runs. And the coach here, similar fashion, your coach is not the coach you'd normally think of. Your coach is an elderly person, a homebound person. You agree with your coach that on a week, once a week or whatever you decide, once a week you're going to run to their house. You're going to bring a newspaper, share a cup of coffee, have a chat, that's all, and then you'll run home. In the process though, you may be the only person this person sees all week. You have brought a ray of sunshine into their life, you have connected them to what's going on outside their own situation. Think about the needs and haves that we're matching. Tremendously powerful. And again, no money exchanged hands. It didn't take any technology that we don't have. It didn't take any kind of insight. It, very simple. But it did require a website, again, some simple technology to connect like this. This is huge, in my opinion. I love this example, and I wish that cities and, and governments around the world would support it. And speaking of which, when we look at this from a city perspective, what was very interesting is that as Good Gym grew, the NHS, the National Health Services in the UK, had two really big realizations. One, the magnitude of how many people are living isolated and disconnected and homebound in the UK. And two, how so many of the dollars or the pounds they were spending on healthcare were actually really inefficient. So what's happened is NHS and multiple local councils and boroughs in the UK have partnered with Good Gym to help them rethink their healthcare delivery and social care needs. This again is one of the best, I think, examples of social innovation, where we're transforming not just people keep staying healthy, but we're re-establishing and expanding connections, connectivity, meaning, depth, friendships, you name it. That's good, Jim. The final example that I'm going to talk about tonight is at the intersection of the future of work, skill sharing, and a new form of what we can think of as micro-entrepreneurship. This is Leah and her dog, Kobe. Leah founded a company called TaskRabbit, which some of you might have heard of, and Kobe is responsible for the company's founding. The story goes something like this. It is a cold winter night in Boston, and Leah and her husband are about to go out on a date night when they discover that Kobe has no food. And we all know where this is heading. And there goes the date night. They're going to be late, et cetera, et cetera. In that moment, Leah thought to herself, God, wouldn't it be great if I could log on to a website, ask somebody to go pick up dog food, come over, feed Kobe, give him a scratch behind the ears. I will gladly pay you for your services, and we go enjoy our date night. Simple as that. In that moment, we have TaskRabbit. Think of TaskRabbit as an eBay for errands. On the platform, you can post all kinds of things that you'd like to have done. And I don't really like the term task. It makes it sound menial. menial. What we're looking at on TaskRabbit are all kinds of services, not just things like delivery of dog food, but also handymen, computer repair, research, or also things like, I like, like writing a love letter, helping somebody write a love letter. And I was reminded that actually the movie Her, which I haven't seen yet, apparently the guy, writes love letters, so I don't know if that was inspired by TaskRabbit, perhaps. But in any case, how the platform works is when you have a task that you'd like to have done, you post it on the site, and TaskRabbits, which is the name for the community members that go and do these things, and that was a name that evolved from the community itself, which I find interesting. They agree to do it, they perform the task, you pay them through the app, again, you peer review each other about the experience, and you're done. What I, another thing that is really compelling about this model, these are all task rabbits. 70% of task rabbits are unemployed or underemployed when they find the platform. Each one of these people is kind of the type of new micro entrepreneur, if you will. And over time, we're finding that task rabbits themselves are forming a kind of community. It's really interesting to see who these task rabbits are. The majority are people who have skills want to be productive in, in society, but need, for some reason, flexible work arrangements, or have traditionally been isolated and disconnected from the workforce. So, for instance, mothers with young children, or retirees. 
They don't want a Monday to Friday, nine to five, or whatever hours you work job, but they do want to generate income and have a livelihood. TaskRabbit enables them to do just that, use their skills, generate some income, and connect with one another in their community. And that is the TaskRabbit mission, help others get things done and help one another in your community. Now, to be sure, I am not claiming and I do not think that TaskRabbit is the solution to the jo global jobs crisis. That's for another presentation where I don't actually think it's about jobs anymore. It's about livelihoods and it's the fact that by 2020, 40% of the US workforce will be what we call freelancers, 40%. That's technically what you can think of as TaskRabbits. This is not about a jobs crisis and this is not a silver bullet, but what it is is again a new kind of marketplace. We are enabling livelihood income generation in ways that simply didn't exist before. And that's a really important thing, again, to think about in the context of the collaborative economy. Especially when, I will say, when I look at the jobs so solutions that are presented by many governments, they don't seem to be working very well either. TaskRabbit is working extremely well. So when we look at some examples of TaskRabbits, this is Chris. And uh, Chris is what we call a super rabbit. He's been doing TaskRabbit for a long time. He was underemployed. He's a handyman. He was underemployed when he found TaskRabbit. And he found that he was really quite good at what is the single most requested task on TaskRabbit, something I think many of us can relate to, <laughs> assembling IKEA furniture, right? Chris, in the process, has been able to establish a small and thriving business around assembling IKEA furniture. He's gotten back on his feet. He's redefined, again, his lifestyle. And, as I like to say, for people, whether it's a love letter or IKEA furniture, if you don't have the time or the interest or the inclination, the ability to get something done, find somebody in your community who can and help them build, again, a new livelihood, a new lifestyle. But it's not just about these tasks like handyman and repair and so forth. This I find a really great example. This woman. Her son was in hospital. He was actually undergoing chemotherapy. And she could not be there to care for him. So she went on to TaskRabbit and vetted a whole bunch of rabbits and ultimately picked Michelle. She asked Michelle to go pick up a blanket and a robe and some healthy snacks and then go visit her son every couple of days in hospital and just see how he's doing. And then, of course, report back to mom how he was really doing. They ended up speaking nearly every day until her son was released from hospital. Think about the needs and haves that this met. Mom feels connected. Son feels a little closer. Michelle is able to generate some income and do something really good for community. I love this example. And we do find a lot of tasks on TaskRabbit that relate to healthcare. So things like dropping someone off at a doctor's appointment or taking them home helping deliver um, a pharmacy prescription. And actually, Walgreens, which is a national pharmacy chain in the US, partnered with TaskRabbit to do exactly that. We've also seen other countries adopt a TaskRabbit-style platform for things related to some sort of healthcare or social care. So in the UK, uh, an organization called the Macmillan Cancer Center has created a cancer support network modeled after TaskRabbit. And then down in Australia, they have this initiative called Silver Troopers, which is elder care, again, sourced within the community on the basis, on the model of TaskRabbit. Before you get too worried, TaskRabbit currently exists in the US and the UK, but here in Canada, and I'd be curious, I'm not aware of, what's, of if there's a specific model here in Vancouver, but in Toronto and Montreal, we have very much of a TaskRabbit style platform called Kutoto, which is exactly this. It, the tagline is getting things done locally. Now, that's just a mini tour of a few examples of how this is playing out. What I want to focus on at this point, and what I think is probably the single most exciting and amazing thing about the collaborative economy, is that this is one concept, the collaborative economy, but it has so many different dimensions and so many different manifestations, as we've seen tonight. You can do this with or without money, with or without technology. You can do this with your neighbor or with someone halfway around the world. You can do this because you want to make money or save money or both, so it hits your individual pocketbook, or you can do it because you want to support local economic investment in your community. You can do it because 
you want to do something good for the planet or because you want to meet other people. I quite candidly don't care why you want to do this. All of those reasons are equally valid. The point that I want to underscore is that this is all connected. And because of this broad range of appeal, it also means that a lot of people, I would suspect not just everyone here, but everyone who's not here tonight, who might never have heard this term before, will find the collaborative economy attractive in some way. And let's think about it moving forward, how we start connecting those dots and recognizing that if you want to do it because of the environmental benefits and I want to do it because I need a little bit of extra money, that's, that's fine. We're still linked. And traveling on Airbnb and taking on a task rabbit and using Lyft, those are all connected. And when you think about stringing together various of these platforms, you do start to reimagine what a lifestyle could look like. And you start to recognize too, just an added plug, that all of a sudden, the amount of money you need to live a really rich, thriving lifestyle decreases dramatically. That's a separate conversation, separate pro presentation. But think about how this plays out. The, I sort of term it like the concentric circles or the ripple effects of how this all works. So let's finally take a look at what this means specifically in the context of cities and this concept of a shareable city. Thus far tonight and in general, most of the activity in the sharing economy or the collaborative economy has been in the private sector. Companies and entrepreneurs, cities have gotten involved a little bit on policy matters, which we'll talk more about in a second, but by and large they have been absent from the conversation. They are a missing voice at the table. And for me, that's really unfortunate because they're a really important voice to have, but also because they are probably the single largest beneficiary of what's going on here. Think about the challenges that city leaders face, the pressures of urbanization and shrinking budgets and climate change and more people moving in, what do you do? A lot of times we look at cities and hear city leaders talk about things in terms of scarcity, scarce resources. I would argue that through the lens of the collaborative economy, we're looking at, a, at cities of abundance. And I like to think about having, putting on goggles, sort of like collaborative economy goggles, that give you x-ray vision to see the idling capacity in assets throughout a city. Imagine walking down the street and being able to like infrared, see the space that's sitting idle, see the cars that are sitting idle, and put those assets into shared use at the macro level, you start to reimagine the city itself. So on one hand, we can think about how the city could apply these principles to its own activities and become a sort of sharing platform more than it is today. Libraries are a great example of this. But I think libraries are one of the greatest institutions and I think we're going to see a resurgence in libraries, but not just for books, for sharing and accessing a whole lot of other things that benefit the community. In addition though, local governments play a key role in establishing the regulatory and policy environment to enable collaborative economy companies and others who are involved in, this, in these activities to thrive. And of course, looking at this again from a social innovation perspective, cities play a key role in educating, advocating, and promoting this kind of activity as a mechanism for social transformation. So let's take a couple minutes and talk about what some cities around the, do, around the world are doing to become more shareable. In the United States, last summer, the mayors of 15 US cities, including San Francisco, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, Los Angeles, key players, big cities, but also mid-sized cities like Louisville, Kentucky, and Des Moines, Iowa, signed the Shareable Cities Resolution declaring their support for the sharing economy. Those efforts are now going global, and I'm, I have my quest to sign up a Canadian city this week. It might not happen this week, but the offer is open. I can certainly help you with that. If we travel down south to Brazil, there we find that the governments of Rio and Sao Paulo have partnered with Airbnb in advance of the World Cup and the Olympics. This is going to ensure that more people can travel in more ways and that it won't all be new hotel builds, but also that the money spent on these events will benefit a broader cross-section of the community 
and it will stay locally invested. This is really, really important. And for those of you who are, have been to Brazil, if you've heard of favelas, for instance, the urban slums, so to speak, which are thriving economies, all kinds of favelas, for instance, on Airbnb, where visitors will be able to have arguably a much more local and authentic experience. If we go over to Sydney, Australia, we see that the government there simply wanted to educate its residents about the collaborative economy. So they established, they wrote what you can think, what is called the Share Sydney Guide. All it is is a booklet that tells you what is this concept, how do you get involved, and what platforms, what companies exist in the city. And then if we travel north from Sydney up to Seoul, South Korea, we find what is quite probably the world's most shareable city, thanks to a truly visionary mayor. He is using the collaborative economy as one of the core pillars for his entire urban planning strategy. He's passed legislation, they've committed investment funds, they're incubating companies, and as he likes to say, he sees the city as a sharing laboratory. And I have the honor of serving on the Global Advisory, so uh, Global Advisory Board for Seoul Sharing City, and let me tell you, I think that Seoul in many ways will be a global leader in the years to come. Now, despite the benefits of being a shareable city, it's not necessarily easy to become one, and the main reason is policy. Why? I mentioned it briefly in the context of Lyft, but by and large, the rules governing the collaborative economy today were created before any of these companies existed, and often before the internet itself. So you can imagine how outdated some of them are. They, they never imagined that we would be able to connect with these magical devices called smartphones, and that we would be able to share things. We built the rules around an ownership society by and large, ownership and pre-smartphone. So just imagine how clunky some of these results look. So what happens is that, as I mentioned with Lyft, a lot of times companies find themselves in a legal gray area or regulatory gray area. There's no law that really fits. Or, every now and again, a transaction which everyone would agree has some kind of social benefit looks illegal. Or, more commonly, this is where my like, legal training factors in, although I joke, it doesn't take a lawyer to read laws and, and be like, this just doesn't work. You, you actually can't tell if the law applies or not. This leaves everybody in limbo. The companies, the users, the policymakers, investors, just bad outcome overall. Now sometimes these challenges are expected, like outdated laws. Other times, they're other times they're unexpected, like I know you have encountered here, for example, with bike sharing. But bike sharing and then later on you realize, oh, mandatory helmet laws. Okay, wait, we need to think about this more holistically. You are not alone in that challenge. This is playing out in cities around the world. And other issues that often come into play are related to things like insurance and taxation and my personal favorite, which is the difference between personal and commercial use. We know how to regulate individuals, so to speak, and we know how to regulate businesses, but we don't really know how to regulate people as businesses. So in other words, at what point does renting out a spare room in your house to help make ends meet become a business? Right? These are thorny issues. And policymakers are hesitant to get involved, they don't want to rock the boat, and in their defense, there really is no easy way to learn about what other cities are doing around the world. But what I want to make clear is that this is not unique to the collaborative economy. This is something that we've been dealing with throughout history. It's part of the natural process of innovation. And the example I like best in this way is that of the car. When the car was introduced, way back when, the rules in many cities said, you can drive a car on the street so long as it doesn't go faster than a horse and buggy. Now that seems ludicrous to us today, but you can understand why they would do that. New technology, it's disruptive, it's innovative, it's exciting, but good grief, we do not know where this is going to go. I joke that the collaborative economy big picture is kind of in that situation today. And this is what makes me extremely excited about the work we have ahead of us, because these are completely surmountable problems, completely surmountable issues, challenges that we face. It takes human ingenuity, it takes governments being bold and embracing what's going on, and not necessarily th seeing things as black and white. 
thinking about regulatory structures that can grow alongside these new kinds of companies. Two areas where there's very little debate that the collaborative economy can help cities are resilience and sustainability. Resilience planning and emergency management, how do we boost resilience in a city? We can look at the example, for instance, of Hurricane Sandy in New York City in late 2012. After Hurricane Sandy, thousands of Airbnb hosts contacted the company and said, I would like to provide accommodation for free to people affected by the hurricane through this platform. The company ended up partnering with the government and played a key role in hurricane recovery. Think about that. Again, it didn't cost anything. This was the community showing up. We can think about the floods in Calgary last summer. And by all accounts, I think Mayor Nenshi did a great job. We had supper with Mayor Nenshi last night. He did a great job, and he gets the collaborative economy. I can assure you of that. Um, but think about what we might do moving forward, how the collaborative economy could further improve those efforts, could put booster rockets on what's going on. One final example, and a good example of how this is playing out, let's go to San Francisco and look at a company, a consortium called BayShare. BayShare is an organization that has partnered with the local government, and its mission is to help increase resilience of the city, specifically around emergencies. So they've partnered with the Department of Emergency Management, and they have a seat on the city's disaster council. BayShare itself is a consortium of companies, each of which agree in advance to share some part of their platform, their community, the assets they have access to in the event of an emergency. And they agree to do this in advance because, as we all know, the best time to plan for an emergency is when there isn't one. This very hard to debate that something like this is good for cities and doesn't run too amok of policies. And also that policies don't really look the same in times of emergency. And last, and I, wow, this slide went really tiny and colors are funny. But bear with me, and I'm happy to share this with you afterwards. I joke that I could actually have given the whole presentation just on this slide. What I'm trying to do here, because I know that Vancouver in particular is such a hotbed of sustainability and sustainable consumption and the work that Vanessa is doing and so many of you in this room are doing is around sustainable consumption and production and rethinking that. What we did was basically match up the drivers of the collaborative economy with the drivers of sustainability and just see where do we net out, where is their overlap. And what's, well not that incredible, but what I love, the overlap is extraordinary. If you care about sustainability, you absolutely care and want to support the collaborative economy. I will not bore you by going through all of this. I know we have wine to drink and whatnot. But just one example. In the collaborative economy, one of the key drivers is access over ownership. In sustainability, we talk a lot about zero waste or circular economy principles, cradle to cradle. If you collide those two things, what do you get? You get more efficient value chains, literally at every point in the value chain. You get new business models and you get more resilient systems. It's a pretty simple example, but you get the point, and we can go through again line by line, and looking not just at environmental sustainability, but also economic sustainability, and the sustainability or resilience of communities. Now, finally coming to Canada, shareable Canada, what do we see here? Well, we're not aware of any Canadian city that has declared itself to be a, a shareable city, though again, I'd love to change that this week, or soon. But we do see a lot of ad hoc, programs and initiatives happening across the country. So as I mentioned, huge shout out, and we've mentioned it in every city this week, to the Sharing Project, which is not just Chris here, but it also has the support of Van City and the City of Vancouver. Extremely exciting what you guys are doing, and I actually would love to talk to you about how we get what you're doing here into other cities, not only in North America, but around the world. We see lots of green city, greenest cities, um, initiatives here in Vancouver, but also in Toronto and in Montreal, really rethinking green space and urban space, spaces owned by the public that can be used more efficiently, again, with economic, environmental, and social benefit. And I was excited to find that in the research for this that many Canadian embassies around the world actually share space with UK embassies. Now, I don't know if they're doing that to save money, or because they want to have lower, en lower carbon footprints, or because they want to meet their fellow English colleagues. Again, though, I don't care why they're doing it. 
The fact is they're doing it and it's a good thing. They are saving money. They are doing something good for the environment and they are meeting more people. Simple as that. What I want to challenge all of you tonight to do is to think about what do you want to see and what can you do to help make this happen? This is really the mission and the message that Cities for People will be able to carry forward. And on that note, final point, this is also what we've been talking about this week, part of the launch of Cities for People, which is a nationwide initiative focused on exploring how to enhance the social, economic, and ecological well-being of cities and how to build more sustainable, thrivable, resilient places to live. Hopefully you can see how the collaborative economy and the shareable city concept mesh really neatly with this vision. And the collaborative economy will be one of the ideas that Cities for People continues to carry forward. And to have that vehicle for next steps, again, is a really special, important thing to note. You guys are in a, in a position of luxury to have this happen. I can't tell you how many people wish they could have something like this around the world and don't. We have the tools and we see the dots we need to connect. We just need to connect them a bit differently. So think about what you can do, how you can be part of this process, what you would like to see in Vancouver, how you might like to see Vancouver connect with other cities. Because there's no better way to get involved, no better time to get involved than right now and no better place than right here. So with that, I look forward to building a more, a more shareable, collaborative future together. And thank you again. There you go. Thank you so much. Thank you, April. That's wonderful and so exciting to hear all the different examples you bring. And I've, uh, we're going to now go into a dialogue period. And